waiting for you. Actually, we've only got a minute to go. Numbers are dwindling. People must be hard getting beautiful. <laughs> yes. Peter's presenting the first one. Isn't <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll make uh, a start on uh, the, the second of our latest resuscitation trials uh, sessions. Uh, I hope this is going to be an engaging and invigorating uh, session for you. In terms of structure and format, it's going to be very similar uh, to the, uh, the, the presentations on the first day. We're inviting lead investigators from the studies to give us a 10-minute synopsis of their uh, study and the key findings before then being discussed by the, uh, the panel. We're going to try uh, to get some more interactivity from the panel um, than, than, than last time, and, and we'll see how, uh, how that goes. Remember, Andy Lockie is the, the chief uh, uh, Twitter master at, at the front and monitoring activities. If you have questions, comments, uh, please tweet using the uh, ERC18 uh, uh, hashtag. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Kudenchuk, who's the Chief Investigator for the OUT study. Peter, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the, um, the honor and privilege of being invited to this exciting meeting and for being able to share with you uh, the highlights of uh, this particular trial. I have no uh, commercial conflicts of interest. Just in the way of background, there are 400,000 cardiac arrests out of hospital each year in the United States. That number can be multiplied many-fold worldwide. More than 80,000 of those events are caused by shockable rhythms, VF and VT. And although those rhythms are a minority of the rhythm presentations for cardiac arrest, they're important because, as you know, those are the most treatable and viable patient group who present with cardiac arrests. That said, the majority of VTVF episodes are not shock terminated or they may recur after shock and are deemed shock, shock refractory. And shock refractory VFVT is associated with worse survival from cardiac arrest. The purpose of antirhythmic drugs is to electrophysiologically stabilize rhythms. In 1950, lidocaine hit the radar as a drug that was used in cardiac arrest and associated with recovery of a patient. And in 1973, intravenous amiodarone became available, and it was recognized, as you can see and appreciate in this uh, rhythm panel, has an effect of uh, stabilizing ventricular arrhythmias and returning uh, sinus rhythm. So the rationale for the use of antiarrhythmic drugs in shock refractory cardiac arrest is to electrically stabilize rhythm that shock hopefully results in producing. Now, the guidelines for both the American Heart Association and the ERC emphasize that shock therapy, when it's ineffective, can be treated or recommendations are made for treating shock refractory rhythms. And in the most recent guidelines, amiodarone was the preferable drug of choice. The problem is that there has never been a definitive placebo-controlled trial that has demonstrated whether any antiarrhythmic drug improve survival to hospital discharge after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And so the ALP study was designed as a randomized, double-blind comparison of amiodarone, lidocaine, or neither drug, that is placebo, on survival to hospital discharge after shock refractory out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. This particular trial was um, uh, sponsored by the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. It was entirely government supported by the U.S. and Canadian governments. And it was performed against, across 10 clinical sites across uh, North America, Canada, and the United States in trying to be a real world effectiveness trial. Over the two and a half year course that the trial was conducted, nearly 38,000 patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest were evaluated. The majority of these patients were excluded from the trial because they either did not present with VTVF as their cardiac arrest rhythm, or the rhythm terminated before they could be randomized and treated, or they had other exclusion criteria. In the end, 3,026 adults with initial VFVT that was refractory to more, one or more shocks were enrolled in the trial and treated with either amiodarone up to 450 milligrams, 
lidocaine up to 180 milligrams, or placebo with approximately 1,000 patients in each treatment arm. You can see by this slide that in terms of the demographics of the population, age, male gender, public location of cardiac arrest, whether the arrest was bystander witnessed, whether bystander CPR was administered, and the time from the emergency call to EMS arrival on scene was similar in both groups. The ALPS study was performed in context of an emphasis and a systematic evaluation of high quality CPR in all study patients. These are the CPR process measurements that were measured across the board in all, that, all randomized patients. And you can see that the quality looks pretty good in terms of the average compression rate, the compression depth, and the CPR fraction, which um, was, it was uh, consistent with guidelines and similar across all treatment groups. By the time the emergency call was given until treatment with study drug amyo, lidocaine, or placebo was actually administered, averaged about 19 minutes across all three treatment arms, none of these differences being statistically significant. Although patients were eligible to receive study drug after failure of one or more shocks, given the tiered system in which many of these patients were treated, that is, fire department personnel with defibrillators initially managed patients until paramedics came on scene who could provide advanced life support measures, on average, before receiving study drug, three shocks were administered in all three treatment groups. What's notable, however, is that after study drug was given, the additional number of shocks that was required to treat these patients was significantly lower in the amiodarone and lidocaine treatment groups than it was in the placebo group, as you can see on the order of roughly half. One of the mechanistic endpoints of this particular trial was the frequency of admission alive to hospital. If we look at that in terms of uh, the numerical differences between amiodarone and placebo and lidocaine and placebo, there was about a 6 to 7 percent absolute improvement in admission alive to hospital in both treatment groups or an average relative improvement of between 15 and 18 percent. The adverse effects that were experienced in this particular trial were relatively infrequent. Cardiac pacing during the first 24 hours of uh, hospital stay was more common in amiodarone recipients, and there was a trend for more clinical seizures in recipients of lidocaine. But overall, the incidence of serious adverse effects were relatively low. This trial ended in terms of all interventions at the point of hospital admission. Thereafter, treatment was not controlled in terms of treatment arm. However, the hospitals remained blinded to which patients received what treatment, and the study did monitor the treatment patients received in all three treatment arms during the course of hospitalization. And if one were to look at the frequency of emergent cardiac cath, targeted temperature management, or where care may have been prematurely withdrawn, there were no differences that were seen between the three treatment groups. The primary outcome of the trial was survival to hospital discharge. Of the 3,026 patients, we knew that outcome in 3,011, and numerically, amiodarone and lidocaine achieved a higher survival to hospital discharge than placebo. However, those absolute differences of between 2 and 3 percent were not statistically significant. A secondary endpoint of the trial was neurologically favorable survival, which meant being discharged, a uh, discharged with a modified Rankin score of three or less, which means the patient was minimally disabled in terms of could be, could be discharged living independently or with minimal assistance. In the amiodarone and lidocaine groups, there was a numerical be benefit in those particular treated patients, but as you can see, those differences were not statistically significant. If one were to strictly focus on the 692 patients who survived a hospital discharge, what's notable is that 76% of survivors 
had a modified rank and scale, scale score of three or less at hospital discharge. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, the mean rank and score in survivors was about two across all three, three treatment arms, I think indicating that neurological functional survival was very favorable. The trial, however, has been interpreted, I think, as depicted in this particular slide, having missed its primary endpoint, and as concluded in the New England Journal of Medicine, neither amiodarone or lidocaine resulted in a significantly higher rate of survival uh, to hospital discharge than placebo. To put that, uh, that result in perspective, I think we need to recognize the limitations of any trial in cardiac arrest, particularly time to treatment. Coming back to that point about the time difference between the emergency call and when drug was administered was 19.3 minutes. And I think as Bob Namar made the point yesterday, that's pretty close to the ground when you're thinking of opening a parachute. The problem becomes even worse when you realize that 911 or the emergency call is merely a surrogate because collapse, which is really when the clock starts ticking, is actually an earlier event. There were two populations that were randomized in the ALPS trial, those with a bystander witness cardiac arrest and those with an unwitnessed cardiac arrest. The reason that's important to distinguish is because that 19.3 minute time interval from uh, the collapse to uh, administration of drugs was probably the best estimate in witnessed cardiac arrest because if witnessed, that collapse to call would be relatively short in time interval. On the other hand, in an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, the collapse likely occurred earlier with a longer time interval to 911, meaning in that group of patients, the time interval to treatment was probably much longer. If we look at survival in the witnessed versus unwitnessed cardiac arrest group, the influence of time to treatment really you can see what effect it had on survival outcome. The trial hypothesized in an a priori subgroup analysis that the bang for the buck in amiodarone, lidocaine versus placebo would be more likely seen in witnessed arrest where the patients would more likely be more viable because of being treated sooner. And if we look at that outcome, survival of the hospital discharge in the 1900 patients who were treated with amiodarone versus placebo or lidocaine versus placebo, that hypothesis was borne out. A 5% absolute improvement in survival to discharge, a relative improvement of 22%. What about the patients with unwitnessed cardiac arrest? No difference whatsoever in terms of outcome. What I think we can summarize then from the results of this particular trial are depends a lot on your perspective. One could look at the bottom line and say the net effect was not statistically significant, and this is another nail in the coffin of pharmacologic therapies and cardiac arrest. Or one could say in witness cardiac arrest, there was a statistically significant 5% um, absolute improvement in survival, and that was a p-value for interaction between, between uh, witnessed and unwitnessed arrest that was highly significant. On the other hand, in unwitnessed arrest, there was no pain, no gain. You didn't hurt the patient, but there was no benefit, probably because their viability wasn't that good to begin with. So it all depends on your perspective. Net effect, not statistically significant, or recognizing that three to 5% improvement in absolute survival means 180,000 more patients, 1,800 more patients saved each year from cardiac arrest in the US alone with potential implications for public health impact. Thanks for your attention. Okay, lovely. So uh, we've, we've got uh, about 10 minutes now. And uh, Jazz, you chair the Advanced Life Support uh, Task Force. What implications does this trial have for practice? I think, Liz, can people hear me okay? Good. Uh, there's a couple of things. Clearly, well done to the Rock Group for another great trial. This is a big study, and even though the primary endpoint didn't show a difference, these secondary endpoints do show that if you get amiodrone or lidocaine early, it may make a difference. And I think that's quite important in that if it, 
early CPR, early defibrillation fails, I personally would be happy to have amiodrone or lidocaine. And I think that's important because this study showed lidocaine probably does similar to amiodrone. And it's important to point out the formulation of amiodrone used in this study isn't available in Europe. It's called Nexterone, and it's not the gooey stuff we use. It's a more expensive one. So lidocaine is probably similar to amiodrone. It improves ROSC and survival to discharge if it's witnessed, so it makes a difference. So if I had a cardiac arrest and early CPR and early defibrillation failed, I would be happy to have amiodrone or lidocaine. And if I ended up on the ITU comatose, that would be a good outcome for me because that would mean my family can see me, be with me, be involved in decision making for me to die or become an organ donor. <laughs> we won't go for votes. Uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> On that lovely note, uh, I would... Uh, uh, I would say that, you know, from a task force um, standpoint or from looking at this in as a great presentation, putting it into, into the context, I'd say a couple things. I'd say that I think confidently um, most on the task force and we, from reviewing this, um, it would seem that amiodarone and lidocaine seem to be equivalent. I think that would, that would be something I would confidently be able to say. What was less clear was the advantage of amiodarone or lidocaine to placebo. But when you look at that question, um, as Peter put forth, is there was a 3% absolute difference, and it was non-statistical. But I think it's also important you go into a trial and you power a trial based on what you anticipate a treatment effect, what you think is something that's clinically meaningful treatment effect. Um, it is possible that there was a clinically meaningful treatment effect that wasn't powered for, and maybe that clinically meaningful treatment effect was an absolute difference of 3%. We wouldn't have seen it with the total numbers there. Um, and I think the other compelling th you know, component of that is this concept of time. And I think the concept of time is important, again, you know, in terms of, of th that there is potentially a, a subgroup population that could benefit. Um, but the second thing, and the reason I think time is important, is because traditionally with guidelines, we have, a z uh, we, we have traditionally said, this is the approach we should use for blanket cardiac arrest. But when you look at this study, this out-of-hospital study, and it shows us this concept of timing, it's important to remember that out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and in-hospital cardiac arrest might not be the same. So we noted that, I think, in, in our discussions with the task force, but if you look at the time the drug delivery of about 19 minutes, if you're an in-hospital cardiac arrest provider, um, you may be getting to a patient within five or 10 minutes, right in that spot where Peter was showing some of that sub-analysis of, of benefits. So it, it's important to, to remember that this is an out-of-hospital arrest study. It gives us some potential insight about what could be um, beneficial or not beneficial in an in-hospital, but it's not the same, and particularly because of timing. So I guess in sum, I would say that I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, echo what, what, what Jazz said, is that I think that we're looking now is that amiodarone or lidocaine, I could confidently say that they seem to be equivalent, and less confidently, but at this moment, when you, particularly when you look at the totality of the, the other alternative treatments and the outcomes in cardiac arrest, I think that um, giving one of those rather than doing nothing um, would seem to be the, the, the way to go. Okay, that's great. Now, if it's okay, I'm going to bring Judith in on that point around uh, timing, and then I'm going to pass to Laurie because I think she had a, a comment, and then I'm going to have a question for Laurie as the evidence-based queen, but uh, Ju Judith first. Yes, thank you, and congratulations also to the team. Because when you see these studies that are nicely summarised, it belies the amount of work that underpins them in preparation and ethics and training and, and monitoring. So congratulations to the team. Um, time seems to be an issue that's um, arising in a number of our trials. Time to drug administration, time to treatment. Um, I think it's really probably is, is worth looking at. However, it bothers me a little bit about if we start sending the message that drugs are the priority, what that may then do to our, um, our attempts to get good quality chest compressions, no time off chest and early defibrillation. I think what we need is a drug that can be given IM and work and they can walk in, pull it out, shove it in, and then get on with the, the CPR. Because I can absolutely imagine if we give the priority to getting the drugs in first, we're gonna see hands off chest drop dramatically, and that would concern me. 
So thank you, Jude. Now, Lolly, can I just ask you a question to start? Because we've heard from both of the, the chairs, if, if I've understood correctly, they'd be happy to recommend amiodrone or, or lidocaine, but we heard from Jazz that actually the formulation of lidocaine that was used in this trial isn't the one that's, uh, sorry, amiodrone isn't the one that's commercially available uh, to us. Does that have any impact on the, the you know, the recommendations uh, that, that people should be making? And what's your take on that? Testing. So, <clears throat> I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth it to purchase a drug uh, or to pay what is required to get this drug into the Canadian market, because we don't have it either, um, for such a minimal difference. And, you know, we all sat around the table as rock investigators and decided 6% was the clinical significant difference we could live with. And anything less than that, we weren't gonna bother to achieve, the sample size would have been too big, but six, we were willing to change. And now that we didn't achieve it, and we got a couple of subgroups that are sitting at five, we're saving our faces by saying, wasn't five wonderful? But I think the truth of the matter is, we all decided a priori it had to be six or it wasn't, a tr wasn't superior. So with that in mind, I think that we should look carefully at the science, and if you don't have Nexterone, and you don't, and you, like myself, agree that, this, that Peter and everyone around the table did a good job designing the trial, then this trial is neg negative, and I wouldn't use it. Okay, thank you. Now, Imogen, if I could bring you in as a, as a practicing paramedic, what, what do you think is the most important thing, you know, that should come from, uh, from ILCOR, from the European Resuscitation uh, Council, in terms of the effects that it may have on yours and your colleagues' practice? I think the, um, I think the, although there's not been statistical significance shown, it's highlighted that clinically more are getting to hospital, um, but I think the subgroup analysis with the bystander and the bystander witnessed um, raises the biggest kind of influence. And so there's all the time to treatment and you can't really control that with unwitnessed arrests. And so I think if there's an emphasis more on the bystander CPR and so if there's an emphasis more on the quality CPR, the early CPR, and getting the CPR training into schools is gonna have a positive effect on that, um, then you can, that would be kind of the guidelines or the guidance that I would take as a paramedic on the road is to try and influence greater of the basics being done right because the drugs aren't making that bigger impact. They're making an impact that more are getting to hospital, but it's not that bigger amount. And so I think if you're doing the things that actually do make the difference, then that would be the greater emphasis for me as a para. Okay, that's great. A one sentence um, reply from uh, Laurie before bringing John in for a, a, a patient's perspective. Imogen, a medic said to me after this trial, he said, if we walked in the door and like Judith suggested, had some way of getting the drug in within five minutes of arrival of a paramedic with drug giving skills, then perhaps we would have seen a difference in this trial as Mike Danino alluded to and as Peter alluded to. Um, what do you think about that concept of walk in and give something and then get on with it? Yeah, I think, I think the time is the biggest aspect because we have IO now, but getting IV access and even getting IO access, it still takes a lot of time. And so the time to administration is always going to be extended. Whereas if you've got something like IM or subcut or anything that's just unsheath the needle um, and administer, then yeah, I think it would be a positive aspect. Okay, thank you. And, and John, any thoughts you've yeah. reflected on in, in here? A couple of thoughts I've got on it. As a patient public advocate, um, I'm very keen that obviously trials should come up with drugs that are, are going to increase the people that survive from out of hospital cardiac arrest. But what Peter didn't say, and I don't know the answer to this, uh, we found sort of on paramedic two that we got some real good feedback from the public um, right from the start by involving them and giving them an opportunity to um, exclude themselves from the trial if they wanted by wearing a bracelet. I don't know whether this trial offered that or whether to use the term that one of our English newspapers used, the patients were guinea pigs without having any say in the matter. And, and I do think in all these trials, it's vitally important that the patient's point of view is put forward because uh, in the end, it, it boils down to them and their families. And uh, I don't know the answer with this one. I don't know whether, 
Okay, yeah. Lor Laurie. So um, in the trial, uh, the way Peter designed it was every site got bracelets, rock bracelets, which yeah. would exclude you from all rock trials, and they could apply for it. We were a Canadian site, and we received 50,000 of them, because we were a very large site, and we handed out not a single one. But I did get one telephone call where someone wanted the bracelet, and when I explained to him that that would mean he would get the standard of care and not get randomized into the trial, he said, well, the trial has a potential to make it better. I said, yes, but the arms are equivalent. He said, oh, I don't think I'll take the bracelet. Thank you. Okay, did did you. you have a patient public representative on your management group? Uh, not on our student. We're long before people appreciated the value of having patient. We, this was, we, were, we were conceived in 2006. Oh, okay, so thanks. long before we appreciate okay. the value. And I'm just quickly going to ask Andrea. So I think we, we've heard that in the UK trial, a, a method of people expressing their uh, opinion not to participate, that's a formal opt-out or, or waiver of consent in, in the, the US. What, what would happen in Italy in, in this sort of trial? Very good question, actually. Uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, it's difficult to, to decide on the data that we have, but I think uh, it seems to me that time matters. I mean, mm. probably time of administration could uh, make some difference. Okay. For example, it was uh, I noticed that uh, it took uh, three minutes mo more uh, after enrolling of the patient to give uh, uh, the antiarrhythmic drugs after the first dose of uh, vasopressor, for example. It, it means that, uh, if I remember, it took uh, 16 minutes from the call of EMS to give the first dose of uh, vasopressor, and uh, due to the enrolling time, uh, it the uh, three minutes more uh, were needed to administer uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. Probably it could be another uh, time that okay. we can save if we give uh, the, both the both antiarrhythmic and vasopressor together, for example. Okay, now I've been a very bad chairman and my co-chairman is about to sack me because I've run over, but I do want to get a quick indication from this uh, expert panel of uh, if, if you're in charge of your EMS and you have to make a policy decision now. Uh, put your hand up if you're going to, and I'll give you all of the options, but it's going to be the amiodarone that was used in this trial, standard amiodarone, lidocaine or nothing. So you're the EMS, you've got to make a policy decision. Put your hand up if your policy decision is to recommend the style of amiodarone in this trial. Okay, so no one's putting their hand up or they didn't follow the question. The next one, <laughs> the next one is your policy decision. Are you going to uh, recommend to your teams uh, that they use um, the normal form of uh, amiodarone that's more widely available? If they're using it or at the moment. If they're using it at the moment. Okay, and, and then the same question, uh, but for lidocaine. Okay, so we've got some, like, and, and then uh, placebo or, or don't give anti-arrhythmics. Okay, well, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a fascinating uh, debate from our panel, a great presentation from, uh, uh, from Peter Kudenchuk, and it's now time to uh, not only change pace, but also size, uh, and move down to little people, and I'll hand over to my co-chair. So while we have a switch in panel, indeed we move on to uh, pediatric ne neonatal uh, influential papers. There's a bit of a change meaning uh, we split up, we'll have the pediatric paper and then a bit of discussion and then again the neonatal paper and a bit of discussion. We'll try to stick in time. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, session but a bit complicated and a nightmare for chairs. Um, the first paper, and I'm very glad to introduce uh, Vinay Nardkarni. I could have a long list of what whatever he has already done in his life, but I'll stick with one word, a resuscitation giant. Professor Nardkarni will talk about the TAPCA trial, therapeutic hypothermia uh, after pediatric cardiac arrest, and he has 10 minutes. Well, thank you, Patrick, and <clears throat> thank you to you all. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk about the therapeutic hypothermia after pediatric cardiac arrest trials out of hospital and in hospital. <clears throat> um, the only potential conflict of interest I have are that I had funding as an investigator on the THAPCA trials, and I am also a member of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and the American Heart Association, which make recommendations for post-cardiac arrest care. 
The two trials that we'll talk about today are really credited to Frank Moeller from Michigan and Mike Dean from Utah, who are the co-PIs of this study. And through their hard work over more than 16 years in preparation, they were able to assemble and conduct these trials in children. First, the, child, the therapeutic hypothermia after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and then in 2017, the publication of the in-hospital component. Both of these trials were funded by the National Institutes of Health, supported by PCARN, the Pediatric Emergency Care and Applied Research Network, and run through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the NIH. The study design is similar for both the in-hospital and out-of-hospital trials, a screened population of survivors of cardiac arrest, <clears throat> then eligibility criteria applied, and the out-of-hospital group sorted into either therapeutic hypothermia with a target temperature of 33 degrees versus therapeutic normothermia with a target temperature of 36.8 degrees, similarly for in-hospital cardiac arrest. We'll talk about the studies separately, but their therapeutic interventions were identical, surface cooling to either the target temperature of 33 degrees for 48 hours, followed by three days, or 96 hours, of therapeutic normothermia at 36.8, compared to a group that was just cooled to therapeutic normothermia of 36.8 for the entire five days. The notable issues in both studies were that informed consent, individual informed consent was required, and the children had to be randomized within six hours of return of spontaneous circulation, and they had to remain comatose on arrival to the ICU with a Glasgow Coma Score motor response of less than five. The hypotheses and the primary outcomes of both studies was that therapeutic hypothermia compared to therapeutic normothermia would improve survival with good neurobehavioral outcome at one year, and secondary outcomes of a safety hypothesis that blood product use, arrhythmias, infections, and 28-day mortality would not be increased in those with therapeutic normothermia compared to hypothermia. The primary outcome measure at one year was the Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Score, which is well-normed, has domains including communication, daily living, social, and motor function, and has been validated over the age range from birth to 21 years, and also is offered in both Spanish and English. And these evaluations were done by a single center at Johns Hopkins University. The complex consort diagram highlights include 1,355 meeting initial screening criteria but they were unable to randomize in six hours 254, lack of aggressive care for 208, and a motor Glasgow Coma score of less than five in 190, uh, of greater than five in 194 with active bleeding in 66. 64 were not approached, 120, 112 did not consent, and thus 295 were randomized out of 475 eligible, 62%. In the modified intention to treat analysis of those children that started with a normal Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Score, 138 were randomized to hypothermia and 122 to normothermia. The characteristics of the out-of-hospital group, 50% had pre-existing conditions, 39% were bystander witnessed, and 65% received bystander CPR. The initial rhythm was rarely bradycardia, and rarely initial shockable rhythms, and the median duration of CPR was 25 minutes and three doses of epinephrine. The out-of-hospital cardiac arrest trial achieved the separation of the two groups and was not hyperthermic, and the main outcomes were therapeutic normothermia, 12% favorable neurologic outcome at one year, compared to hypothermia, 20%, with a likelihood ratio of 1.54 that did not achieve statistical significance. The one-year survival was, again, 9% better in hypothermia, but again, the likelihood ratio did not achieve statistical significance. When more elegant neural outcome studies were done, they correlated with the violent adaptive behavioral scale at 12 months. And when the Kaplan-Meier curves were done for relative risk of survival to one year, 
There was a strong trend in favor of hypothermia, but it did not achieve statistical significance. The only statistically significant outcome of survival to one year was the duration of survival, again in favor of hypothermia. All of the main safety outcomes, blood product use, arrhythmias, culture-proven infections, and all-cause mortality at 28 days were not different between hypothermia and normothermia groups. The overall uh, conclusion in the paper was then that therapeutic, nor that therapeutic hypothermia as compared to therapeutic normothermia did not confer a significant benefit in survival with good functional outcome at one year. The interpretation, is the club half empty or half full, was laid out in a very nice summary by Bob Berg where the negative trial statistically was compared to the underpowered but positive clinical outcome. ILCOR then for out of hospital cardiac arrest recommended that it is reasonable to use hypothermia or normothermia after cardiac arrest for children. They recognized the underpowered but positive outcome, but they also recognized that therapeutic hypothermia is resource intensive and requires associated expertise necessary to deliver and maintain therapeutic hypothermia. ILCOR created a post-arrest checklist which now includes therapeutic hypothermia but does not designate which target temperature to uh, try to achieve. And the ERC also had a similar recommendation that is permissive of both ranges of hypothermia. In switching to the in-hospital setting, very different population, as Mike Danino mentioned. 2,791 met initial screening criteria, but they were unable to randomize 358 Lack of aggressive care was selected by families in 442. Active bleeding in 260 and 110 were either on high dose epinephrine and exclusion criteria or already on ECMO at the time of the arrest. 198 were not approached or not resourced and 214 did not consent to randomization. 329 were then enrolled in the intention to treat of the 746 eligible, 44%. And the modified intention to treat analysis included 257, 133 in the hypothermia arm, and 124 in the normothermia arm. A very different population, 91% had pre-existing medical conditions. The initial rhythm at the time CPR was started was 57% of the time bradycardia, and an initial shockable rhythm was still a small proportion of 10%. The median time to CPR starting from identification of cardiac arrest was zero minutes. The median duration of CPR, 22 minutes, and the median doses of epinephrine, 4.5. Of note, 55%, 55% of the children were already on ECMO at the time of randomization or targeted temperature management initiation. Similar to the out-of-hospital group, they achieved excellent separation between the targeted temperature groups and the median time from return of spontaneous circulation, which was known, to randomization was 4.8 hours. The study was stopped early because of futility after review of the data and safety monitoring board. There was no difference in favorable neurologic outcome at one year or one year survival. The duration of survival was similarly not significantly different, and there were no safety outcome differences. The conclusion was that for in-hospital cardiac arrest, therapeutic hypothermia as compared to therapeutic normothermia did not confer a significant benefit in survival. Additional sub-studies that have been published included, include nurses' attitudes towards clinical research, neurobehavioral neuro outcomes at one month, which showed that three-month outcome was similar to 12-month outcome, characterizing family burden, which was large and could be predicted from the three-month assessment to reflect the 12-month burden, subsets of children of drowning, which similarly did not show differences in outcome, functional outcome trajectories that, again, three-month outcomes predicted 12-month outcomes, and patient characteristics associated with outcome, particularly acute life-threatening events, weekend arrest, and long-duration CPR. Safety and efficacy of TTM was demonstrated and reported. Drowning had better outcome than respiratory etiologies, 
and early post-resuscitation hypotension showed no difference. There was no difference in incidence of uh, post-resuscitation hypotension in the therapeutic normothermia versus therapeutic normo, uh, hypothermia group, although it was common and hypotension was associated with outcome. Future publications will continue to come from this, uh, from this study, but I'm very interested to hear how it will be interpreted by the experts. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, one of the rare pediatric randomized controlled trials and an important one, I think, the fourth circle of the chain of survival we all value. And maybe where uh, my co-chair ended, I would like to start with the panel asking who of you would now still apply uh, permissive hypertension or therapeutic hypothermia, therapeutic hypothermia to your population of patients? For first question for out of hospital cardiac arrest. And then secondly for in of out hospital cardiac arrest. <laughs> Waving hands. Okay, uh, maybe I'll start with Ian as a pediatric task force chair for ILCOR, but also uh, pediatric emergency medicine specialist. Uh, there's a big difference between trials and then the, your, your reality of practice. Did this influence? Were you still doing it? Did you change your practice? And uh, that's why we put in the bit about resource and about resource allocation and utilization as, as to how you could do it. Uh, TTM is possible where I work. The availability of TTM is, in terms of pediatric patients, is not universal in, in the UK. So horses for courses in some respect. Um, Vinay uh, uh, has, did, has done an extremely nice presentation and the question between the balance of normothermia and hypothermia does in slight part hides the fact that to have normothermia you often need active cooling as well. So there's a mismatch in those sort of populations potentially and they're quite heterogeneous. Um, cutting to the chase of it, the co-star suggestion was on the basis of the expert um, uh, considerations by the panel in that we thought that there was still equipoise by reason being, this was for the out of hospital cardiac arrest, that the tendency of the Kaplan Meyer survival curves and potentially again underpowering, although that's always difficult to know. Uh, it's difficult to know when you do have enough power sometimes, depending on what sort of size effect you want. So sort of a chicken and egg. It, it's much like Lewis Hamilton, who I think is going to become uh, the fifth time world champion in Formula One. That's with his really high-powered RCT, which is well-powered. Just remembering that he started with go-karts, which wouldn't win a Formula One race. So there's something about looking at the background evidence of sample size and the sort of results you want, not necessarily knowing, but as the trial evolves, that particular trial, you get a better idea. And don't forget, this is just one study. Um, a huge study, but as you saw, it whittled down to quite few numbers, relatively speaking. I heard you saying, you not know, in all uh, hospitals in the UK, it's possible to do it. And in the ILCOR, it's, it's also talked about dedicated and resources. Is this also a plea for having specific pediatric cardiac arrest centers? And no, I, th I think it's recognizing the fact that the ILCOR guidelines are supposed to be global and therefore supposed to be appropriate to the settings uh, uh, around the world, recognizing that there may not be the facilities to maintain uh, what's required to, for TTM. Similarly, the same principle with ECMO, for example. And as an educational specialist, uh, we have a lot of these complex messages where it's needed this or needed that, and maybe somewhere in between. This isn't something we can teach. Yeah. Do we need to be more left right then? And yeah, just... you know, and I think you do. And I was going to tease Ian because I knew he was going to be a little non committal here. I, I knew his favorite breakfast was waffle, um, his favorite plant is hedge. Uh, but I thought that he'd actually make a call here. Um, and, and the reason that I think we probably want clarity around this is, is to look at this and, and just think about this. This took 38 pediatric centers. There was actually 45, but only 38 submitted data 
um, over it's six years of data to, to pull this together in a way that's never been done in pediatric uh, resuscitation ever before. So, it, and, and the entire planning time took 17 years. We're not likely to get more information. So yes, we would want more information. The ultimate proof is a systematic review, meta-analysis, but what we're gonna be faced with is this is our data for the next 10, 15, maybe for every time frame. So we've gotta make some decisions there. I think that they put a, an expected 20% difference between groups um, and, and, and they were thinking, or 20% effect size, and they were thinking that that would be able to get their numbers, right? And, and that's why they did it. They were pragmatic about it. They wanted 276 subjects and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. To think about it, I don't think any of us a priori would have expected an effect size of 20%. I think we would have all expected that therapeutic hypothermia, if it's gonna work, it's gonna be a little bit less than that. Um, we would need a larger sample, sample size, and if we're going to collect uh, that much information, that, that that's what would, would, ha would help us. Um, so because of that, um, I think this is the best evidence we have, and the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, I, I will still continue to pull. I think you definitely want to comment on that as a researcher. Yeah, so I just, uh, I just want to uh, echo that point. I think there's sort of an obsession with the uh, p-values and confidence intervals, and we just have to realize that uh, pedi pediatric cardiac arrest and, and other conditions in, within cardiac arrest, traumatic cardiac arrest, for example, are relatively rare conditions, and I think we need to treat them as that. Um, <clears throat> and there is a whole literature and a whole sort of methodological development on how do you do trials in rare diseases, and you have to be a little bit more flexible. You can't just look at the p-value and say, is it above or below 0.05? Um, I think we'll see a good example in the next presentation, one way you can, you can analyze data uh, when, when the condition is rare. But you have to, the question is, does this work or does it not work? If, if you look at the trial results in isolation, it's more likely that it works than it does not work. And it's more likely that it, on one side it either works or it does no harm. So you have a condition that is more likely to work than not do any difference. So that's why I would use this therapy. Uh, of course, that's not perfect and that's not ideal. And in adult cardiac arrest, we would probably not accept that uh, as a final answer. But in pediatric cardiac arrest, we just have to accept some of these things and say, you know what, we don't know, but we are not gonna know the next 20 years. Um, and there are signs for uh, secondary endpoints, uh, no show of harm. I think, I think this, to me, this, this trial shows that this is, with the evidence we have right now, the best option for for these kids. Maybe John, as a, as a patient, I as a patient would find it very confusing that, that medicine is always this sort of gray and never black or white where you can just say, this works, so do it with me, and this doesn't work, so don't do it with me. Yeah, yeah you notice we'll congratulate the authors and the work that they did, but we won't actually thank them because they just made it more muddy than they did. <laughs> right, right? Yeah. so they, they did an absolutely fantastic job, but there's not a thank you that comes with that. <laughs> thank you. John, maybe? No, from my point of view, and I was thinking, going through it, I mean, the technical side, I leave to these experts on my right, but the two things there that caught me, one was that it, trial was stopped, one of the trials was stopped when it was seen that uh, nothing useful was being obtained, and the second thing was the consent that was obviously there before they enrolled patients, and uh, they're the important things from, from my point of view, and uh, say from the technical point of view, I'm just delighted that these trials are going ahead because particularly when it involves children, it's very close to all of our hearts, particularly when you're a grandfather and soon to be a great grandfather like I am. Um, that's important. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move, and there's, there's there, a final there, comment. There may just be a, a question that might be interesting for John and the audience. Um, would there be a patient perspective on, one of the things that people feel that the study didn't show the, the full effect was cooling took them six hours to get to. Um, and that partly related to the process of getting consent. Mm -hmm. Now we all understand the importance of that and I would never, never take that away. But one of the criticisms that I had of the paper and one of the reasons it may not have shown the effect it should have was that they took so long to cool. Um, and so as a patient perspective, how would you feel about in this circumstance if the, the role for consent was waived until people were enrolled and then asked after enrollment, if it allowed to get the answer that you really wanted. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know why, why it would take that period of time in the days of these things now. Mm. I think the, these things have made a big difference in getting consent. Um, from my point of view, I think you've got to do, you as a doctor, and, and from the I know certainly with my children and grandchildren, 
my faith is in the doctor. And, and if they feel that there's benefit in it, then they should go ahead. But uh, I do think consent can be obtained nowadays with the internet, with the tele uh, mobile phones, far quicker than that could in the past. Okay. Um, I fear I'm going to stop you there. In view of time, I would like to call on stage uh, Professor Wickoff from uh, Texas University. Uh, she's a professor in neonatology, has a lot of influential papers, and one of them uh, is therapeutic hypothermia in newborns after hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. We've got the 10 minutes for you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to share the results of the late hyperthermia trial that was done by the NACHD Neonatal Research Network of which I participate. I am not the lead author. Abbott Laptuk um, was the PI on this. Um, and we had 21 different centers that participated. Um, if you think it's difficult to get children into trials, it is very difficult to get newborns whose mothers um, may well be anesthetized and unable to give a meaningful consent. Um, into trials, so this was a, a very big challenge. Um, I have no financial relationships to disclose. So newborn encephalopathy is a clinical syndrome. It's most easily recognized in late preterm and term infants, and the incidence is about three per 1,000 live births. There's multiple causal pathways for this, but it's often seen in newborns who receive significant resuscitation in the delivery room due to asphyxia or lack of gas exchange either before, during, or immediately after delivery. And hypoxic ischemia encephalopathy accounts for about 30 to 50 percent of the cases of newborn encephalopathy, and it is clearly associated with both death and significant disability. Um, what we know from the prior hypothermia trials is that HIE does appear to be a modifiable condition in newborns. So the prior studies that had been done, we had six randomized controlled trials that were published between 2005 and 11, and that involved over 1,300 newborns. They were all of gestational age of at least 36 weeks. They had staged inclusion criteria, and the goal in all of these trials was to get on the cooling blanket by six hours of age. Some of the studies utilized head cooling, others looked at whole body cooling. The cooling was done for 72 hours, and there was a standardized rewarming protocol, and the primary outcome was death or disability at 18 months. When you combine all of those trials together, both looking at the selective head cooling as well as whole body cooling, there was significant reduction in death or disability in the hypothermia group. So that ultimately, if you look at the Cochrane systematic review, the number needed to treat was around seven. So it is important to remember that the parameters for the cooling regimens for those trials was based on the best available animal data at the time of the trial design. And we can't assume that the various cooling parameters, such as the time of initiation, the duration, the depth of temperature decrease, and the rate of re rewarming are optimal. In fact, the rationale for longer cooling became even stronger with the growing appreciation that the temporal profile of pathways to injury are not limited to the early hours following birth with hypoxia, hypoxia ischemia, but actually extend for days following the insult. Some of the best evidence that cooling should be started prior to six hours of age comes from Alistair Gunn's work. This was a series of remarkable studies in fetal sheep whereby the fetus was instrumented in utero and had a cooling cap attached to the head. Vascular occluders were placed around the carotid arteries and the animals underwent brain ischemia for 30 minutes followed by 72 hours of head cooling starting early at 90 minutes, delayed starting at 5.5 hours, and a group that was studied with late cooling at 8.5 hours after the start of seizures in this model and was compared to sham animals, which are shown in the white bar. The slide shows the extent of neuronal loss on the y-axis and different regions of the brain on the x-axis. The extent of neuronal loss is reduced the most if cooling is started within 90 minutes, 
less protection when started at 5.5 hours, and even less protection when started at 8.5 hours. So this was the data that was used to justify initiation of cooling prior to six hours in the early clinical trials. However, let's focus on the cooling at 8.5 hours. Overall, there was no difference in the neuronal loss score when compared to sham animals with a p-value of 0.11. However, in the parasagittal cortex, the extent of neuronal loss was reduced by cooling from 90 to 82%. And the neural, neuronal loss was lower in the striatum, and the differences bordered on significance for the dentate gyrus. And these data suggest some biologic plausibility for initiation of cooling at greater than six hours. When looking at the age of initiation of hypothermia for the 1,300 plus infants in the Toby registry between 2006 and 2011, nine to 10 percent were cooled between six to 12 hours, with only 2.2 percent cooled after 12 hours. These observations provide clinical rationale to study late initiation of cooling, including therapeutic drift in the absence of evidence, which was certainly occurring in the NICUs across um, the United States at least, Geographic constraints, could you get a patient who was born in a small hospital to a cooling center by six hours of age? Some babies seem to have a reasonable neurologic exam in the first six hours and then progressed with late manifestations of hypoxic ischemia. And then sometimes you just have late recognition of the process. So, um, it was decided that the NRN would design and perform a cl another clinical trial to address the possible benefit of hypothermia initiated after six hours of age um, for those children that couldn't get to early cooling clinically. The PICO that was used to frame the question was that infants greater than or equal to 36 weeks gestational age with moderate or severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy who are between six and 24 hours of age would be cooled to 33.5 degrees Celsius using an esophageal temperature probe for 96 hours. And this was done for a longer time frame because the preclinical animal work suggested that if you delayed, you would get better benefit if you cooled longer. And this was going to be compared to maintenance of the esophageal temperature in the control group at 37 degrees. So similar to the last trial, there is still an active cooling component potentially for the control group. And this, the outcome was death or disability at 18 to 22 months. For frequent analysis, um, as was done in the last trial, you are determining the probability of the observed data if the null hypothesis is true. Um, and typically, if the p-value is less than 0.05, then the probability is greater than 95%, representing an alpha or type 1 error or false positive conclusion of less than 5%, and one rejects the null hypothesis. You have beta error, which is your type 2 error or false negative result, and you fail to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is correct. So you need a certain power to avoid this, and this is always the problem in newborn trials. Frequentist um, statisticians orderly, ordinarily recommend against conducting a randomized trial if it's not feasible to achieve a conventional sample size estimate. However, the alternative would be to conduct no trial and to allow the use of hypothermia beyond six hours to creep into clinical practice based on anecdotal experience or at best observational studies. For instance, if we were to assume that late hypothermia would provide a positive treatment effect but less than early hypothermia, um, which in the early hypothermia trials, you reduced it from 64 to 48% for a risk difference of 16%. And we would assume that we wouldn't get such good results with late hypothermia. Um, let's say we only got a 10% risk difference. Then we would need 392 infants in each group. And that is going to take over a decade to accrue, even with a network of 21 centers. And so Bayesian analysis was recommended. This is a reasonable approach for trials with a known limited sample size. Um, with Bayesian <coughs> analysis, um, you're looking at the probability that the hypothesis is true based on the observed data. A it's a formal method to assess the range of treatment effects compatible with the best available evidence, and then you estimate the probability of a benefit. So it provides useful data even when a definitive result is unlikely. 
the probability estimates can reflect the perspective of a skeptic, an enthusiast, or a clinician with equipoise. So for the sample size um, analysis, it, this was pre-specified in our design to be a Bayesian analysis, and we would need 168 um, sample size. This was the largest feasible number of infants that could be studied, and we estimated this from the NRN first primary hypothermia trial um, and looked at the reports of progression in that trial where kids went from stage one to two or three. The primary analysis was adjusted for level of encephalopathy and the age at randomization, and the p-values were only provided for descriptive statistics and components of the primary outcome. So this slide is showing you how Bayesian analysis works. Um, you plot the risk ratio on the x-axis and the probability density, which is the frequency distribution of the observed values on the y-axis. And in contrast to traditional frequency analysis, a Bayesian analysis uses pre-existing data from trials that already existed, observational studies, and animal work to establish a prior distribution which represents the probability of a hypothesized treatment effect. If there is no prior information to indicate a benefit or harm from the intervention, then you use a neutral prior. A neutral prior is centered at a risk ratio of one as indicated by the solid line, and it indicates a 50% probability of benefit and a 50% probability of harm. Alternatively, the prior can be centered at values less than one if you feel that the existing data suggests real benefit, or greater than one if you're worried that it suggests potential harm. Given the lack of data for initiating hypothermia after six hours, a neutral prior was used for our study. The prior distribution is then combined with the observed data from the trial to yield a posterior probability of treatment effect as indicated by the dashed line. The posterior distribution can be characterized by a point estimate, a 95% credible interval, which is not the same thing as a confidence interval. It's the 95% probability that the true risk ratio lies within this interval. And you look at the area under the curve which is less than the risk ratio of one, which represents the posterior probability of a treatment benefit. This also means that the area under the curve which is greater than a risk ratio of one represents the posterior probability of treatment harm. So in our study, um, the children were, uh, the babies were a term, 39 weeks was the average age. The majority of them were outborn and transferred into a cooling center. Many of them, over 50%, were intubated in the delivery room. Um, a quarter of them had chest compressions. They were very acidemic with cord pH of 6.96. Um, a third of them got onto the cooling blanket between 6 to 12 hours, and two-thirds were between 12 and 24 hours. And the vast majority had moderate encephalopathy on their neurologic exam. This is the posterior probability of reduced death or disability with late hypothermia using a neutral prior. Death or disability occurred in 24.4% of the cooled group and 27.9% of the non-cooled group. In the diagram, the neutral prior is represented by the white solid line. When using a risk ratio, the curve is asymmetric since the risk ratio less than one can only go to zero, while risk ratios greater than one can go to affinity. The area under the curve is equal for the, the relative the risk ratio that is less than and greater than one. So plotting on a log scale makes it symmetric. Is the time? Sorry, I have to get to the results. This just took much longer. I apologize. Okay. So um, what ultimately we found was that you can see a, a, for a 2% difference in absolute relative risk, the posterior probability was 64%. You have to decide, is a 2% difference and a probability that you get that benefit, um, is that good enough? We have examples in both perinatal medicine and adult medicine where therapies are offered with that similar sort of number needed to treat. Um, and where we found the benefit, it seemed to be mostly in converting kids from being in a severe and um, severe um, disability to mild disability. There was no difference in cerebral palsy. So in conclusion, the Bayesian analysis suggests a possible treatment benefit, but it's not conclusive because it's a Bayesian design. 
you have a 76% likelihood of any reduction in death or disability, 64% probability of at least a 2% reduction. And so your decision to initiate hypothermia late is based on the probability of benefit, the frequency of adverse events, which were relatively low, availability of alternative evidence-based treatments, which at this time we have none, and it is very clear from this trial that the results should not delay efforts to recognize HIE early and initiate hypothermia within six hours of birth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for pushing you a bit, but we'll try to have a short discussion. Uh, is, it, is there a microphone? Thank you, Mario. That's, uh, it's a very interesting, thought-provoking study and an important topic and a very difficult area to study. And it is a question that crops up in our, in our practice. I think, really, my, my question to my, my fellow panelists is how much weight can we actually give to this Bayesian analysis? We've got a 64% chance of a relatively moderate 2% improvement. Uh, and I was interested in the previous panel's comment about a 6% improvement being something that they felt was sufficiently high that, that they would adopt. Although I note, I'll just comment uh, about uh, this being more than p-values. I'd be interested to know what my colleagues think. Not from a clinical perspective, but from a mythological perspective, I think this is a, a very, very nice way of analyzing this. I think talking about a clinically meaningful difference when we're talking about severe disability and mortality seems a little strange to me. Uh, if you can save 1%, that's a good thing. Of course, there is things like cost effectiveness and all, but, but that aside, if, if, we, can, if we can save 1%, that, that's, that's significant to me. Um, I think just one quick comment about the Bayesian analysis. I think it's very elegantly done here. Uh, importantly, uh, it does, with a small trial like this, depend a lot on the prior you decide. So what is your prior probability? Um, people should really uh, take a look at this paper because they very nicely did the different analysis with different priors, but it does matter. So it, it, it is like with all research, it also depends on what belief you have before. Um, so if you think very strongly that the earlier trials uh, worked and that probably translate, well, then this trial sort of reinforces that belief. Uh, so we've discussed this backwards and forwards, and, and I, I'm so pleased to have Lars sitting beside uh, me and for Myra to explain that because um, it makes me feel really old to have to come to terms with Bayesian uh, uh, methodology. I, I think that we are all going to have to come to terms with it, we're all going to have to learn it, but at the moment, using what is presented, um, I think it's, it would be very difficult to get um, hard-headed financial investment to be able to, to do this on a 64% chance of a 2% improvement when even the final line is may have benefit but uncertainty still remains about how effective that is. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing for us, I think, to come to terms with. I, I think it's even harder for people that um, have to provide money to expand services to come to terms with. Uh, and I'd be in interested in, in um, in John's thoughts, because I'm, I'm absolutely certain it'd be difficult for parents to, to come to terms with. They'd want to, is it good, is it bad? Uh, uh, because if you think it's good, go for it. And I think you're right, they'd go for a, so 1%, yeah, I'll go for 1%, let's, let's go for that. But that's a very difficult call to make. I, I think this highlights again, though, um, both this study and indeed the other studies that Myra mentioned, um, all, all of those entries were quite late because I think parents find it really difficult to make dis decisions, John, about somebody for who they have total responsibility. S slightly different when it's you, perhaps, yes. or me. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. But if you then see such a difference even between 90 minutes and six hours, it's a bit strange that six hours is still the early start of hypothermia. Well, I mean, I, th I think that's why we, we do need to take this data on board because I think Meyer is absolutely correct that we had seen uh, creep moving into the, the distant uh, future of, of cooling uh, and uh, not only in terms of this gestational group of babies but also other gestations on the basis previously of no data whatsoever. So this is the first data that, that's properly presented, uh, and so it's just going to need a lot of thinking, which is already giving me a headache. 
maybe just a quick comment. I think, I think the reason why we normally use uh, p-values and statistical significance is because we like yes-no things. We like to, to say yes, it works, yes, it doesn't work. Un unfortunately, that's not how the world works, right? There is a probability of something working, and, and that's the nice thing about this Bayesian uh, thing. It's not what we've been taught. It's not what we're taught in medical school. We, we thought this is how it is, this is how it is, uh, whereas that's probably not the truth. There's some probability of something happening or not. So it will require a completely different sort of framework and a way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> but I do think this is sort of the way forward, especially for these rare uh, diseases or rare conditions. So I confess when I read this paper, I then went and Googled Bayesian analysis to learn a bit more about it. Um, one of the things that, that struck me is whenever you look at any treatment or intervention, there, there's pros and cons to that. And the, the pros have been outlined using a, a Bayesian methodology. And cooling isn't a completely benign treatment, and there, there can be side effects. And those are recorded in the paper, but use a sort of standard frequentist type analysis. And it, it sort of felt odd that the pros were being analyzed one way and the cons were being analyzed in a different way. And that may well be my depth of understanding about Bayesian analysis, but I'd be interested in what you think. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's uh, for, a lot of people like to sort of look at side effects, the, the, the usual old way, and that's why we always analyze them that way. But I, I do think that, that this is something, this is a move towards this type of analysis, uh, not, not in cardiac arrest, but in medicine in general. The FDA is starting to approve drugs based uh, on patient analysis, especially for orphan diseases or, or rare diseases, mm -hmm. or things that are difficult to study. So uh, I think uh, whether we want it or not, we sort of have to come to terms with some of these things. I do think it's, it's still very useful to present the traditional way and they do that in the paper so we can sort of compare and learn from that because if you do look at the the confidence interval for the for the sort of normal risk ratio it's quite wide uh, and 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 if we only looked at that we'll probably say well it didn't work um, so it will take a lot of a completely different framework and, and a new way of thinking right. with these things okay I think uh, although it's very interesting to go deeper into this uh, time is uh, ticking so I will leave the last word to John I think because there was a bit of a question from Jonathan. Well, I agreed with the, the point that was made, and I think that uh, th it's more important that the technical people <laughs> discuss this. I agree with your point. It's very difficult for parents, and, um, you know, that's really all I can say on that. But I'm just fascinated. I'm listening here. Much of it's above my head, but I do get the root of it, and uh, I agree with you. It's a very difficult decision for parents to make. Okay, then I will move to the next speaker, and my co-chair is Dan. I thank the Pediatric Neonatal Joint Panel for their efforts in this. Thank you very much. So we have a different panel, but if we maybe uh, uh, kick off first with uh, Henry, and then if the, the, the panel can join us, it will probably make it easier uh, for you to see. So we've got the last of the uh, exciting presentations, and it's my pleasure uh, to hand the podium over to Henry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to re present uh, results from the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium Continuous Chest Compressions Trial. Uh, this trial occurred about three years ago. I'd like to acknowledge all of my colleagues, my dear friends, that made this happen. And on a personal note, this was the first large trial I had the privilege of learning from. And I can't believe all the lessons I learned from all my great friends and mentors on this effort. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, consists of chest compressions alternating with ventilations. However, Human and animal studies suggest that chest compression interruptions may reduce coronary and cerebral blood flow. Experts have suggested altering ventilation patterns to mitigate chest compression interruptions. In the state of Arizona, they implemented these principles into a bundle of care termed minimally interrupted cardiac resuscitation or cardiocerebral resuscitation. This bundle emphasized continuous chest compressions without interruptions, minimal interruptions for rhythm analysis, limiting shocks to a single uh, rescue shock, and a concurrent early administration of epinephrine. And in their protocol, they used passive oxygenation or bag valve mass ventilation, deferring intubation until later parts of the resuscitation effort. The authors of this effort observed an almost three-fold increase in cardiac arrest survival with this novel approach. 
However, the Arizona protocol has many limitations, including its before-after design, the absence of CPR verification, the lack of CPR process data, and the use of a bundle of multiple interventions with low baseline survival. While many studies and communities around the world have observed similar benefits from the implementation of the Arizona protocol, there have been no randomized controlled trials evaluating the technique. With this in mind, we set about to compare continuous with conventional interrupted EMS chest compressions upon outcomes after out of hospital cardiac arrest. This study, the ROC continuous chest compressions trial, was a multi center cluster crossover trial involving EMS agencies affiliated with the ROC network. At six month periods, EMS agencies alternated between strategies of continuous or interrupted chest compressions. Continuous chest compressions consisted of CPR delivered without interruptions for ventilation. Ventilation was provided using bag valve mask only, interspersed after every 10 chest compressions. In the interrupted chest compressions group, CPR consisted of a conventional uh, chest compressions with pauses after every 30 chest compressions to deliver two full breaths via bag valve mask ventilation. The protocol was designed to structure the first six to eight minutes of CPR. This graphic summarizes the, the big picture. Treatment was organized into epics lasting two minutes or 200 chest compressions. Rescuers performed rhythm analysis between these chest compression epics with a single rescue shock as indicated. The protocol emphasized early IV or IO administration of epinephrine or vasopressin. Intubation was delayed until the completion, until the fourth chest compression cycle. Subsequent care was per local ACLS protocols. We obtained CPR process measures on all cases enrolled in the study using state-of-the-art chest compression detection technology. A study monitoring committee provided oversight over EMS agency performance using benchmarks based upon CPR process data. The primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge. Secondary outcomes were favorable neurologic status at hospital discharge and adverse events. The planned enrollment of 23,600 patients was designed to have a 90% power to detect a 1.3% absolute difference in hospital survival. This graphic summarizes the trial enrollment of approximately 39,000 screened patients. We included 12,600 patients in the continuous chest compressions group and 11,000 patients in the interrupted chest compressions group. Patient characteristics were similar between the two treatment groups. These, this table summarizes post-treatment characteristics. They were likewise similar between the two groups. These histograms depict the distribution of chest compression fraction between the two intervention arms. The upper graph depicts the distribution for the continuous arm and the bottom for the interrupted chest compressions arm. And as expected, as designed by the protocol, the mean chest compression fraction was slightly higher in the continuous chest compressions group. Other aspects of chest compression uh, of CPR performance were similar with the exception of number of pauses greater than two seconds being greater in the interrupted chest compressions group. These are the primary outcomes of the study to cut to the chase. Survival to discharge was 9% in the continuous chest compressions group, 9.7% in the interrupted chest compressions group. This difference was not statistically significant. And survival with good neurologic function was, similarly, uh, was similar between the two groups as well. Now I'd like to shed some light on some interesting secondary findings in the study. Usually in a clinical trial, we struggle with uh, determining whether a patient actually received the assigned treatment. Did a patient assigned to drug A actually get drug A or did he accidentally get drug B? And we try to sort out the effect of this misassignment through per protocol or as treated analyses. Now you can imagine for a protocol involving 10 minutes of CPR, determining what type of CPR they actually received can be quite difficult. And so as highlighted on these graphics, sometimes, as in the upper left-hand panel, it was very obvious that the patient received continuous chest compressions. 
And sometimes, as depicted in the upper right-hand panel, it's very obvious that they receive interrupted chest compressions. But more than once in a while, you get the panel on the bottom, which is a mix of the two techniques or uncertainty about what, what uh, technique the actual patient actually received. Through a lot of groundbreaking homework, we developed automated systems for classifying these cases as continuous or interrupted chest compressions and validated this methodology using um, uh, ratings given by our project coordinators. And so using these techniques, we performed two per protocol analyses. Uh, the first one, depicted in the upper lines, uh, assesses the differences in survival, limited to those cases clearly classifiable as continuous or interrupted chest compressions. The upper models uh, classif make the classification by automated analysis, and the bottom model depicts the results when you use manual co project coordinator um, uh, classification of the case as continuous or interrupted chest compressions. And the interesting result that you see is that in this per protocol analysis, survival seems to be higher in the interrupted chest compressions group. Regarding adverse events, uh, they're summarized in this table, and in summary, sure, there are no discernible, no important differences in adverse events. So in conclusion, in the study, we found no differences in outcomes between continuous and interrupted chest compressions in the resuscitation of out of hospital cardiac arrest. Strengths of this study, this is the largest cardiac arrest trial ever carried out in history, encompassing over 23,600 patients. Other strengths of the study include a wide range of participating EMS agencies, as well as our systematic measuring of CPR process on every case. Limitations of the study, we did not uh, study uh, methods of oxygenation or ventilation, and we also did not mandate uh, post-resuscitation care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for that, uh, that excellent presentation. Uh, as the panel are uh, grabbing their seats, I'm going to put Nigel Reese on the uh, spotlight uh, to, to start with, because I know he'll thank me for that later. Yeah. Uh, Nigel, you, you, you've heard the results of, of, of this, the largest trial ever to have taken place in, uh, in, in the history of resuscitation uh, medicine. What, what does it mean for you and, and your practice? Okay, so um, it's, it's really great to see such a, such a large trial. Um, my role, as you know, Gavin, is uh, as a paramedic, been a paramedic for, for a long time in Wales. But also, I'm the research lead and, uh, and I'm responsible for, for developing and delivering the trials that, uh, along with our academic partners. And so I was uh, really encouraged by the, uh, by the design, the, the cluster randomised control uh, design that they used. We've used this design in other, in other studies and... Um, I like the way that, um, that the, the investigators uh, sort of moved from the sort of had a run-in phase where they, they trained the, the, the staff, the EMS staff, and then uh, not until they were trained sort of moved them into the, the recruitment phase. When we've, we've uh, sort of delivered uh, cluster trials in, the, in, in our uh, service, there's been a challenge, isn't there, that, that when clusters go live, you need uh, as many people trained as, as possible in that, in that treatment because uh, obviously otherwise when they go live, you're, you're, you're sort of um, evaluating uh, clusters with, um, with very limited sort of data. So that, that was a big positive, huge numbers. Uh, I think one of the uh, points that I, I did sort of uh, find in, in the study was the chest compression fractions that, was, uh, that were in the study design. As per the sort of protocol, there was an improvement in the con con uh, sorry, um, continuous compression group. But overall, the compression fraction in, that, in this uh, sort of study seemed to be higher than previous studies. And uh, I'm just wondering when you transfer the findings into other settings, uh, whether the quality of CPR uh, of uh, compressions would, would have a bit of an impact on, uh, on the study. 
i.e. if you introduce this strategy into a, into, into a lower quality setting, whether there could be improvements. So um, really encouraging sort of methodologically. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from it uh, in the UK as far as recruiting in such big trails. So if we're going to push you before uh, coming to uh, get, getting Jazz's comments, so you, you, you've seen the, you know, the, the, the great work. Practice in Wales, I, I think, is, un sorry, is interrupted yeah. compressions and ventilations. Are there things there that would get you changing your practice? Well, I think the message for me is to concentrate on high quality uh, compressions um, and, and sort of make sure that's right at first yep. and, uh, and, and ensure that's the case. I think there's, a, there's an interesting question across these studies around um, the role for international trials. Uh, so when you, you're translating mm. these findings into guidelines which are international, do they translate into our setting, which, uh, which maybe we don't have that, that high quality performing systems? Jazz. Yeah, so great big trial, but I don't get it. And the reason I don't get it is, I thought when I read the title, of this study that they were comparing 30 to 2, 30 compressions to bagging versus just continuous compressions with no bagging. But then I read the study and they're trying to bag the patients during continuous chest compressions for the first six minutes. And I thought, well, when I try and do that in real life, and sort of tr blowing up the patient's stomach and getting gurgling and stuff like that. So what were they doing in that continuous chest compression group? And the per protocol analysis shows clearly the patients did worse. So carry on doing 30 to two and pausing for breaths when you're bagging a patient. That's my- Claude. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that was my so you, you've got a lane clap, so let's hear if, uh, if Claudio can get a louder clap. Uh, this was also my impression, because guideline states that once the airway is secured, you have to shift from 30 to 2 to a continuous chest compression. Well, actually, this trial, which was fantastic trials in terms of numbers, uh, they, pro they perfectly fit the uh, predicted sample size, was comparing six minutes of 30 to 2 versus 6 minus a chest compression. Over after that, the airway were secured and they started continuous chest compression in both groups. So I'm not sure whether 6 minutes really can make a difference. Michael, what, what are your thoughts? You, you've heard two, yeah. uh, two, two complementary views there. What, what's, what's the perspective yeah. from the other side of the pond? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, first, one thing that's notable is I think it just illustrates the importance of um, randomized uh, data as opposed to what we saw with the pre-post. Um, and in that pre-post trial, which was markedly impressive, um, uh, our hospital system, or EMS system, we, we were hesitant to switch over. Um, there wasn't a question from the EMS folks in our system of whether it worked. There was just anger directed at why aren't we doing it? And I think that seeing it does illustrate some of the dangers of pre-post analysis. When you see a randomized trial in the groups, arguably are, um, uh, you know, as, as you said, the, the traditional um, could be, inter I think at least arguably you can't say that one was, that the, the um, continuous CPR was superior. I don't think anyone would argue that point. So I think that's important. Um, the other thing that's kind of, I think, depressing for me is to see that there's really just marginal difference in just in general. We're just working our way around the margins here with, with this study and even with other studies in terms of treatment effects and differences. And we had two different, and as you put it out, pointed out, Jazz, you know, markedly different um, or a different strategy. And really, in the end, the numbers really didn't look very different at all. We heard a couple times during this conference about quality of CPR, and and you know you, you know mentioned in even in your own study, you know people said, well, epinephrine doesn't work so, or in terms of protecting and getting more neurologically intact survivals, maybe it works with survivors. And so this whole this whole argument about epinephrine, we need to concentrate on quality of CPR. But in your group of the PEA and assistally, I think the non-epinephrine group, the survivor, if you didn't give them epinephrine, would have been 0.4 percent. Is that correct? So I bet you if you randomize them to stamping on their chest versus the best high quality CPR, you still would see no difference. So my question is, 
what, we haven't even established what is high quality CPR. We had better chest compression fractions. We're talking about less pauses. There was less pauses here. Um, so I think we have to also unfortunately consider the fact that we're not exactly sure what uh, high quality CPR is and it may just be a marginal effect, if any, of the difference between what we consider high quality CPR and, and, uh, and, and any kind of CPR. Yeah, interesting uh, perspective, Kuhn. Um, when you first read this trial, because it's a, a, a couple of years ago, what, what were your thoughts and have, have they changed since then? Well, I was, al I was also thinking of, um, of it being continuous compressions without ventilation. Um, so, and, and maybe, um, as has been said, we, we have uh, overestimated the potential effect of reducing that, that no flow time during ventilation. Maybe we had too high hopes and, and thought that the effect would be much bigger. Maybe it isn't that important. Um, or maybe there is some negative effect of the ventilations interspersed with the continuous compressions. And we know something about chest compressions and the quality of CPR, but we know very little about ventilations. We don't really know what it does in terms of air that's going in during the compressions of the pressures inside the chest that may impede venous return. We actually have basically no way of measuring that during CPR in the field. So there's it's, it's actually a call for more research into ventilation in relation with compressions uh, during CPR. Lovely, right. Well, I'd like just the final bit of audience uh, participation. So I think we've probably heard that there are perhaps three different nuances in the approach of uh, doing uh, CPR prior to securing the airway. There's doing 30 compressions, uh, pausing the compressions to give two ventilations. There's the doing continuous chest compressions with intermittent ventilations, which was the intervention uh, studied here. And then there's the, the other paradigm of doing three to six minutes worth of continuous uninterrupted compressions, but without the ventilation. So uh, in the audience, if your EMS system, are you doing 30 to two, put your hand up. So I think that looks to be about a third of the, uh, the, the audience. Are you doing continuous chest compressions with uh, these uh, intermittent ventilations? So they've kept their hands up for both. <laughs> uh, and then finally, you're just doing continuous chest compressions for a period of time before uh, ventilating. So um, it looks as if from the majority of a European audience that 30 to 2 is uh, is still there. So the group at the front, what would your recommendation be? So not your practice, what's your recommendation? 30 to two? Okay. Um, continuous compressions with intermittent ventilations uh, and continuous chest compressions without focusing on ventilations to start with. There you are, consistency with the panel, consistency with the audience. Uh, we've got a good way um, forward. Thank you all for your time and attention. I've had uh, a text from at least one person saying that the bar is calling, so don't let me uh, hold any of you uh, back. Thank you for your time and attention.